Senator Gazelka, remaining under motions and resolutions. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Pursuant to Rule 26, I designate that the following uh, bills be made special orders for immediate consideration. Members, they're on your desk, House File 14 and House File 113. We will be taking up House File 14, Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just as to House File 14, I, I'm uh, proud and to be standing here in front of you offering this bill today. Uh, the way I look at House File 14 is it's a rural finance authority that offers a $35 million bond that uh, goes to help beginning farmers. It uh, goes for ag improvement programs. It uh, helps restructure loan programs for farmers. And it also uh, helps for livestock expansion loans. Uh, last year, this would nor or it normally would be included in the bonding bill. However, last year with the bonding bill not passing, what we did is we, uh, because of a timeliness factor, when it comes up to farmers uh, trying to plant in preparation for the uh, upcoming farming season, we pulled it out and it's going to run it as zone clean bill. Uh, again, uh, the the bond uh, allows for uh, it's it's service through local banks. And what ends up happening is the, the bank is, uh, approves the loan. The 45% of that loan value comes from the bond sale. Uh, that, in, in, in turn, ends up lessening the, uh, the overall interest rate that comes upon the loan. So with that, Madam President. Further discussion on House File 14? Okay. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give House File 13 its third reading. Third reading, House File Number 14, a bill for an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for the Rural Finance Authority, authorizing the sale and issuance of state bonds. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll on House File. I guess I forgot to say third reading. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll on House File 14. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and no nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Moving to the next bill on special order. House file 113, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, members. It is a privilege for me to be able to bring forward House File 113 to you today and its Senate companion, uh, Senate File 85. Uh, members, this has been the number one issue that has been impacting my district and the uh, entire central Minnesota region for a long time, and it's regarding the uh, Sherco coal power plant in, uh, in Becker, Minnesota. 
This power plant is generating over 2,400 megawatts of power and electricity to the whole region. It's one of the largest uh, coal burning uh, power plants in the state of Minnesota, and it employs over 300 full-time jobs mainly from in my district, but also from the surrounding areas. And they've been good jobs. They've been excellent feed your family jobs. They've been a position to allow uh, young people just out of school with a, a solid shovel ready job to start a family and get grounded in the community. Um, the Sherco power plant has been one of the huge economic drivers for this entire uh, region. Uh, the Sherco plant pays over 60% of the property tax value uh, of the property taxes of all of Sherburne County, pays over 70% of all of the property tax values in the city of Becker, and it's been a huge driver that has uh, helped fund the, the roads, the schools, the law enforcement, the public safety needs that the city has utilized. Uh, several years ago, uh, there was a plan put in place by Excel, a proposed plan by Excel Energy to take two of the three coal burning units there at Sherco, retire them in 2023 and 2026, and uh, construct a natural gas uh, power plant at that location. And this was a plan that has caused a lot of consternation at first among the, among the citizens and residents in Becker. They wanted to make sure uh, that there was a plant still operational at that facility. They had to work through the changes that this would bring, uh, the, the differences in, in the jobs and the impact after the construction versus the way that it is today. Uh, but Excel has worked through that. They've put it in a resource plan uh, that they have presented to the PUC. They have worked through this process to get this established here for a number of years. And so the discussion has gone uh, repeatedly in the district and with uh, many, many interested parties, including work before the PUC on this matter. And last October, so um, the, the whole package was Excel was going to uh, switch this coal plant to a natural gas plant as well as add uh, additional wind and additional solar and have that be a part of the mix and the portfolio of energy that uh, we would continue to use moving forward as we advance Minnesota to the next uh, generation of energy usage. And so last October, uh, at the PUC, uh, the PUC decided to approve the plan to shut the Sherco units one and two down. They decided to approve the plan to add the extra wind and to add the extra solar, but they decided to wait and hold off before approving the natural gas plan. Uh, they gave recommendations to keep studying alternative options. The PUC even stated in their orders that they believe it is likely for a roughly 750 megawatt gas plant to be at this facility. Excel's proposal with this legislation is for a 786 megawatt facility. Uh, but it has essentially created a vacuum uh, currently in this district. And it's created additional uncertainty that we need to get resolved for this area. Uh, so, Madam President, that is why we decided we needed to come forward with this bill, why we need to get a uh, legislative uh, legislative proposal through in order to rectify this situation and be able to continue to power uh, central Minnesota and our needs going forward. So briefly, members, the bill is very short and has uh, three different sections to it. Uh, section A discusses what the bill will be doing, how it will be building, uh, Excel will be building a plant on the location they own in Sherburne County in accordance with the resource plan that they have filed at the PUC. <clears throat> Section B of the bill refers to the ratepayer statute. And this has been one of the common objections that we've gotten back, Madam President, that, uh, that essentially we're giving this blank check that Excel might put up this, this golden-plated power plant that would just be an enormous cost and would stick the ratepayers with huge increasing energy bills, and that is simply not the case. We are making sure that we uh, keep this 
in accordance with section 216B16, Excel will have to continue to file uh, resource plans with the PUC before this plant is even built. We'll have to continue to prove uh, all of their costs out uh, to Excel before they can collect from any of the ratepayers. So ratepayer protections will continue uh, to be strong uh, even after passage of this bill. And then uh, section C uh, is the uh, sliding scale mechanism. This has been used and used successfully in construction plans before that Excel has used. Allow them to have an incentive to come in under budget with the construction of their plan. And uh, this has been a part that has been added in this uh, legislation as we've continued to work through with it. Uh, this bill is supported by labor. It was uh, promoted and supported in committee in both the House and Senate by IBEW and a number of other uh, labor representatives that came to testify. This is supported by some environmental groups that know that we need to supplement natural gas, have that as a baseload foundation in order to keep using the growing wind and solar power that uh, is growing in our state. Uh, and it is supported by many of my people in my community. You'll see in your packets, members, letters of support. Uh, immediately after we filed this bill, uh, the city of Becker passed a resolution urging the legislature to pass this bill. Uh, Becker Township passed a similar resolution. Uh, Sherburne County, Wright County, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, Wright County and the, Sh and the Becker School District all sent uh, letters of recommendation urging the legislature to pass this bill. Um, members, we've been, have been hearing back, uh, a common argument has been that we've been circumventing the process with the PUC, and my response has been we are finishing the process at the PUC. Uh, they went through the plan, they've seen this proposal for a number of years, uh, we disagreed with the decision that they came to do in October, so I'm here with this bill for some legislative oversight and to continue to complete the process that uh, we believe and that, and that everyone has admitted that is the decision that needs to be made to put this plant in. Um, we've heard about the concern about the increase to rate payers, and we've made sure that that is covered by mentioning, uh, by, by keeping this under the rate payer chapter and statute, and uh, making sure that the Excel will continue to prove every cost before the PUC in order to protect rate payers. And then third, I know that there are some that simply disagree with this uh, form of a power plant that is coming in, and we may have a fundamental disagreement on whether we have gas, whether there is something else to support the baseload power. Members, I still like a coal plant. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I have a problem at all with con continuing on with a coal plant in this location, but under our current situation, that's not an option, and we want to make sure that something uh, remains for uh, Becker and for this whole region. So, members, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, present this bill. This has been worked through by many interested parties as we've continued to uh, go over this, go through the committee process with this. We have been able to make more groups uh, acceptable to this plan as we have worked through, as we've continued to work through compromises. And so this is a good bill here in front of us, members. I thank you for the opportunity to present it and encourage a yes vote. Further discussion on House File 113. Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam President and members. I, I'll have some comments about the general process of the bill and so on and how we should do this later, but I do have an amendment at the desk, the A1 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend House File 113 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 adopted by the Senate February 15, 2017 as follows. Page 1, line 10. This is the A1 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam President and members. The, the first part of this amendment is too small in words, and, and they're not, in my mind, changing much of what you see on the paper. Um, the first one is one we discussed in committee briefly, and it would simply say that Excel, which has, under this legislation, sole discretion 
to build this power plant or not build this power plant. The way this is worded, the way it looks like it's worded is it would be 700, and I think it's 86 megawatts. That's what was in the docket at the PUC, or as revised and approved it by the PUC. If, because in another couple years, Xcel is putting in their new integrated resource plan, saying how much of each type of power they need, how they're gonna meet demand in the coming years, and that changes every couple years. The last one that this is based on, things have been changing since then. And XL recognizes that that may knock down the size or make other changes in it. But basically, this legislation right now makes it look like it's going to be revised by that. But it's solely in the discretion of XL. If they come in with a new rate, a new um, integrated resource plan in two years, and it suggests that maybe because of some other changes, um, they only need a 600 megawatt plant instead of 780 some, they would be building one for 600 megawatts. But under the reality of the way the bill is worded, it's something that's their choice. Even if the new resource plan ends up suggesting it would be better at lower number than 780, they can build it at that level. So this is simply saying that it would be the way the language would read would be they, it's in their discretion, so their sole discretion to build plant basically of the size in the docket, or if it's amended through the resource process, that they'd be building it at that size, not the bigger one than needed, but the right size. That's the first part of the amendment. The second part of the amendment is simply Excel has said, and I think people on both sides are saying, it ought to have an independent evaluator to determine the price. I think this one is a very uh, important, but I'm hoping this would happen anyway, and that is that this evaluator, the independent evaluator, rather than having Excel pick the independent evaluator, have the Public Utilities Commission pick one. That's their job, is to weigh these things out. Make sure they pick somebody that is independent truly from Excel. Um, I'd be happy to stand for questions on this. I think that this is a fair way of doing it. I don't think, I do think that the PUC is going to be, even if we didn't do this bill, I think there would be a combined cycle gas plant built in Becker. I think it'd be sizable, whether it's this big or not, I don't know. But I think that's what the process was going to come out with. There's no concern that the process wouldn't get it done in time for when they need it. But um, if we're going to do it, if we're going to build a combined cycle gas plant there with Excel's ownership, with uh, our rate payers paying for that, if we're going to do that, let's make sure it's the right size. And this First Amendment will clarify that if the new resource plan, as it goes through the process, as it should be smaller, then in effect they would have the discretion to build the smaller one, not the bigger one. Um, with that, I'm happy to stand for questions and ask for a roll call. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Matthews. Oh. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate and understand the, uh, the thought behind this amendment, uh, but the independent evaluator, we've discussed this at length as we've worked through this bill, and the independent evaluator has been just that. It's been independent. It's not been a tie, it's a tied to Excel. It is someone that gives an external viewpoint to the plan and gives their recommendation before, this, uh, uh, before the PUC. So I don't believe that it changes much with that. Uh, and Madam President, I ask for a no vote on the amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Madam President uh, and members, uh, I thank Senator Marty for, for bringing this amendment forward, and I would encourage a yes vote. Um, although um, uh, it, is, it would only be a, a modest improvement uh, because uh, it doesn't change the, the key thrust of, of Senate File 85, uh, which we find on line 1.8. A public utility may, at its sole discretion, construct, own, and operate a natural gas combined cycle electric generation plant. Um, it allows for um, the PUC to revise perhaps the size uh, of, of that, and it allows for on line 119, of course, the, uh, the evaluation of the projected cost to be evaluated in an objective, in an objective way. Um, but members, um, I'll speak to this later as well, keep in mind uh, what this is, does is allows uh, a regulated monopoly to just decide for itself that it's going to build uh, a large 
plant of a certain type uh, and a certain size uh, on its own initiative and, and more likely than not, despite uh, paragraph B, uh, realize uh, a significant return on that capital uh, effort uh, and, and without the actual scrutiny and examination of prudent and reasonable alternatives, a, a key lost opportunity uh, for our ratepayers and for our state. Further discussion on the A1 amendment? Senator Goggins. Uh, Madam President, thank you. Um, I've uh, recently asked the uh, council to uh, review my conflict of interest potential, and uh, they, we have determined that uh, pursuant to Rule 41.2, I move that I be excused from voting on all questions pertaining to House File 113. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The motion does prevail. Further discussion on the A1 amendment? Senator Marty. Madam President, I just wanted to make it clear again that, as Senator Dibble mentioned, this is a monopoly utility. They are guaranteed a rate of return. That's the way the process works. And the point of the PUC, the point of the integrated resource plan is to make sure they're not building inappropriately sized, inappropriately priced facilities that virtually half the state has rate payers paying for. Because it's a monopoly, somebody is supposed to be weighing all the evidence, and that's what the PUC is there for. Excel understands that. Excel is going to make their case there. They were making their case there. And all we're saying that is if they come back a year from now, in the process, it's not going to mess up the timeline. The timelines work. And Excel was not saying that the timeline didn't work. They said they wanted certainty. But it wouldn't change their ability to get this done at least a couple years before they need it. If we say we're going to go through this and when their new process, when the process continues along, if it comes in with a smaller thing, that that's in the best interest of the rate payers, that's in the best interest of the state, that we do the smaller size. If it's their sole discretion for a monopoly business, let's have somebody oversee it to make sure it's not bigger than it should be. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam President. This discussion uh, was held in the Energy Committee, uh, and it was, um, it, we continued to move forward. We rejected uh, this idea in going forward with this. Um, Madam President, uh, the utility will be building this plant. Uh, it, it is still six years out, and while that seems like a long ways out, that is very short in the life of a power plant. So, uh, members, this idea was discussed in the committee. I ask that you continue to uh, stand firm with the direction we intend with this bill and vote no on the amendment. Seeing no further discussion on the A1 amendment, the Secretary will take the roll. Secretary will close the roll. There being 29 ayes and 35 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion on House File 113. 
Senator Marty. Madam President, on the bill, I want to make sure people understand that XL understandably wants certainty for its shareholders. It's shareholders versus ratepayers many times, and this is one where they want to make sure their shareholders are well protected. It's not that the process wouldn't work for them and that they wouldn't get this anyway. I would expect going through the process, they would end up with a combined cycle plant in Becker. Community of Becker understandably is hard hit, and I think we have to deal with that. I think locating a plant in Becker makes sense because much of the grid points that way. But the reason for racing this through is so they get certainty now, not because it speeds up things, because they're not going to need this until I think their estimates were like about 2025, before they set, shut down Sherco, the second of the two units. Um, but they are wanting certainty, understandably. I don't blame the community. I don't blame Excel for it. But this is a monopoly business. And they did acknowledge that the process was fair and it worked. October 6th and October 13th of this year, month before the election, Excel's, I don't know if it's their vice president, it's the person they used to testify at the PUC, said, quote, we're very comfortable with bringing forth the certificate of need for, you know, the combined cycle, which would, under the statute, under the certificate of need statute, requires an analysis of alternatives. Later on, he said, we'd study whatever alternatives got brought forth as part of that certificate of need to make sure we're moving forward with the resource that is needed. They said, the certificate of need statute provides for alternatives to be evaluated, for things to look at so we can make sure we're moving forward consistent. That's a fairly similar quote. And he says, the certificate of need for us felt like the logical next step once you emerge out of a resource plan. They since we got a new president, we got some new things, they decide, well, even though it's a logical process and so on, if we can short circuit that, we give a 100% guarantee we get what we want, and so they're pushing to make that happen now. I am disappointed in that. I understand why they do that. I don't think that we as legislators are the ones who can best evaluate this, and there are lots of conflicting and competing interests involved in this. Not everybody in here represents XL rate payers, but a lot of us do. And this is a billion dollar plant, 800 million for the plant and 200 million for the gas pipeline for it. It's a billion dollar plant that they are gonna collect that on and their appropriate rate of return. That's guaranteed by this legislation. And it would be guaranteed, the right size one would be guaranteed in a couple of years as they go through the process. And the timeline for building and everything else, I've not yet heard anybody from Excel say there's any risk that it wouldn't go through the process on a timely basis that would be done in a timely manner. So all we're doing is saying we're gonna cut out the people, the process we put in place, the quasi-judicial system that weighs all the options, weighs the ratepayer interest, weighs, weighs the utility interest, weighs the grid stability interest weighs the environmental issues. Weighing all these issues, come forward and decide the appropriate plant to be built. And as, as I think most people here would agree, is they are going to through the process. Excel understood that. They knew it was going to come up with a plant, something like this, in Becker. But they don't know the exact size. And this bill, without that amendment, doesn't give us the chance to have any recourse. They get to build this. Our constituents pay for it. I urge you to oppose the bill. And one, one more broader issue here. This, is a, this plant will last, I'm not sure what Excel is planning on it, but I'm guessing 40, 50 years of generating electricity from this. The circle plants will last a long time. The natural gas plants are smoothly operating. They last a long time, too. And while we're very, very concerned today, the authors are very, very concerned about getting certainty for the shareholders and certainty for the people of Becker, I think we've got to weigh the certainty of others too. Like the kids who are born between now and when this, circle, this new combined cycle plant goes down in the next 50 years and their kids and so on. If the weather changes, the more dramatic problems we 
have been, have been projected by not a few scientists, but like almost every climate scientist saying we've got these severe problems when we have one, two, three, four thousand year storm events coming in a couple of decades, you know, when we have all these issues happening, I'd urge us to be a little more interested in not taking away the chances for our kids and grandkids and great grandkids to have a reasonable life of the sort we want. I understand the desire for certainty for shareholders. Any business is going to be interested in that. But we as legislators, instead of stepping in in the process, if we build a plant that's designed to last a lot longer than it can last because of environmental and other reasons, then in effect, we are robbing our children of some of their choices. And I think the certainty of something bad happening to them is looking more clear than the certainty of avoiding problems with this. So I'm just very concerned. We're making decisions now that will last for 50 years, and I'm not sure that the size of this should be short-circuited by the legislature, who is not weighing any of that. We're just simply saying, well, they want to build it, let's let them build it at that size, even if the resource plan in two years says it ought to be smaller than that. We pay for it now, and our grandkids have to live with the consequences. Further discussion on House File 113? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the same dilemma going after Senator Marty and committee uh, on, this, on these subjects. Uh, he, he's taken most of what I was going to say, um, so I'll just say what he said. A couple of, couple of points to add, though, very, very quickly. Uh, Madam President and members, um, you know, I commend Senator Matthews, and he's absolutely doing the right thing, and I don't begrudge him bringing this bill forward. Uh, um, the Sherco plant uh, represents a tremendous amount of tax base. Uh, for Becker uh, and, I, and, I, and, a, and a number of jobs uh, as well, and, and so I'm sympathetic uh, to that issue and, and, uh, and uh, definitely uh, want to be clear that uh, um, I believe that uh, Senator Matthews is, is representing his community uh, in the best way that he knows how, and, and that's a good thing. Um, I do reject, however, the argument that somehow or another, if we don't do this, um, we're, we're threatening jobs, we're threatening jobs in the energy uh, and utility sector. Uh, Madam President, borrowing from a, a recent uh, uh, op-ed in the paper, if we were to invest um, this amount of money uh, into uh, wind power, uh, it's very likely that we would generate uh, well over a thousand uh, permanent jobs in that sector. Uh, Madam President, the fact is, is that um, what is more likely than not to happen, despite some of the language in the bill that says that the utility can go back and, and ask uh, ask the PUC to take a look at the proper sizing, estimate the costs and the like. We're asking ratepayers to spend $800 million to build this plant, $200 million to build the, the uh, pipeline to bring the natural gas to that site. Um, there will be a number of jobs generated uh, to, to build the, the facility, um, jobs that we might forego uh, building distributed uh, and alternative renewable energy uh, around the state. Uh, and. And also, uh, Madam President, um, it's important to remember that uh, with renewable energy, we have no fuel costs. We're also asking ratepayers to, to pay more than $5 billion over the coming years in fuel cost. Um, so this is a tremendous subsidy uh, on, a, on a per job basis, uh, estimated to be about $40 million per job. We can generate more jobs for much less money um, that, that's more stable and, and more secure. We're driving up, we will be driving up rates for rate payers, and those rates hit our residential payers uh, pretty hard and are hard to withstand. And of course we know and we see the, uh, the letter from the faith community signed by several dozen uh, faith leaders that point out that the XL customers will, who will be paying a greater percentage of their income uh, in electric bills uh, will be likely low income and minority members of our community. Uh, Madam President, I, I think this is just a really a, sh a shame because we will never know, because we'll never have the benefit of undergoing the Public Utilities Commission process in which they examine uh, these subjects from a variety of different perspectives. What is the prudent cost? What are the alternatives? Uh, what is the environmental consequence? What are the larger societal implications? The fact is, is Excel regulated monopoly is bringing this bill forward and asking the legislature 
uh, to make a decision um, that they want made on behalf of their shareholders. They will realize a significant rate of return. That's how the regulated monopolies make their money. They, uh, they build uh, capital facilities, and then they realize a return on that, on that capital effort, that capital expenditure. Um, and so we're just simply guaranteeing a stream of income uh, for the foreseeable future uh, for shareholders, and we're asking my utility rate payers, many of them low-income folks who struggle with their monthly bills, to bear the, bear the cost. And we're foregoing potentially even more powerful economic drivers in the, in the changing energy sector in our state. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President and, uh, and members, and thank you, Senator Matthews, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, just going through some of the information that's on our desk, and, and, and Senator Marty has put a letter uh, from the Sierra Club, and, and I just happened to underline something here that was of interest. The legis in the second paragraph, you'll notice the legislature is, is not equipped to evaluate such considerations with the rigor necessary to adequately protect public interest. Members, the PUC wouldn't be the PUC if it wasn't for the legislature. Uh, we're the ones that actually appoint the legislature and, and put them in law. And I certainly, I certainly understand that there might be a place for that. But let's, let's go into the, what's been called the monopoly here, the uh, Xcel Energy Center. Or, not the Xcel Energy Center. That's where I would like to go tonight, I guess it is, but Xcel Energy. Uh, talking about, you know, it isn't their first rodeo coming, coming to this business as well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling real comfortable that they're going through the process, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and moving forward with something that I think is uh, real beneficial to them. And I'm also quite impressed with uh, Senator Matthews. Uh, not too often you'll see these documents on our desk where you've gone through the trouble of of getting local units of government from cities, counties, and townships in the area involved and all voting for this particular business in their area. That is, that is something that, uh, that I think probably too often we, we in the Senate don't do is we got so, get so caught up in, in all our industry and all our, our thoughts about uh, in our inner circle in St. Paul and we forget about sometimes who we do rec really represent and having this is very, very helpful to me, and, and it's telling me that, that their senator is moving in the right direction. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward, and, and uh, I think you've done a wonderful job with this bill, and uh, I would hope people would support it. Before we move on, I'm going to ask the secretary to give the House File 113 its third reading. House File number one. 13, a bill for an act relating to energy authorizing construction and operation of a natural gas combined cycle electric generation plant. Third reading. Further discussion on House File 113. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, members, for the excellent discussion here today. And I just want to, um, to thank some people for all the work that has gone in on this bill. Uh, Madam President, there have been a number of those that have been working on this issue for many years uh, long before I even got here. Uh, it's been a privilege for me to be able to pick it up and try to see it to the finish line here, but a lot of credit is owed to those who have run the first legs of this race that have have uh, pushed for this project in our local community. Um, my, my predecessor and other, uh, other legislators that have fought for this, and I want to thank those that have been invested in my community. Uh, I want to also, I'm encouraged that, uh, that a letter came out last week that the language that we have worked here is favorable enough that we are confident it should be signed into law. And, uh, and I especially want to thank my district uh, that have sent me here. Uh, particularly to the city of Becker, but also to the region. want to say thank you for wanting to stay invested in the community. Thank you for uh, doing this for our kids, for our grandkids, for future generations. 
And I want to say thank you to those who have been working at this plant or have been supporting this plant and that know of its importance and have expressed the concern to me over and over again as I was uh, talking with many people around my district of how important it was to make sure that we uh, saved Sherco, that something uh, remained in this community, and uh, I am grateful for the chance to bring this forward. So with that, members, I would ask for a yes vote here on House File 113. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on House File 113, the Secretary will take the roll. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 39 ayes and 25 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Moving on to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session, Senators Isaacson, and Newton, all, or excuse me, Newman, all day. Senator Cohen from 11 to 11.30. Senator Carlson from 11 to 11.20. Senator Nelson from 11.15 to 11.20. Without objection, they are excused. Further announcements, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, members. Uh, members, I wanted to let you know that today, many immigrants like me will be participating in the day without an immigrant. Minnesota has a long history of welcoming immigrants. From the earliest days of the statehood to today, immigrants from all over the world have come to Minnesota, adding to its prosperity through their economic and cultural contributions. Our goal today is to increase awareness about the growing and crucial role of the Minnesota immigrant communities and how they play such an important role in, increase in strengthening our state economy. Members, I would like to let you know that the purchasing power of immigrants in Minnesota totaled over $8 billion just in 2013. I don't have new numbers, but it's over $8 billion today. Immigrants accounted for nearly 29% nearly of Minnesota's population growth from 2000 to 2013. Members, I also would like to let you know that in the manufacturing industry, in particular, immigrant workers play a critical role in the workforce. In 2011, 60% of the manufacturing employers nationally reported having difficulty finding enough workers available to fill many positions in the manufacturing industry. In our state, many rural parts of the state are having trouble finding enough workers to fill many positions in many industries. So today, senators, uh, many immigrants will be marching to the Capitol, and I would like to invite you to come and say hello to your constituents. I hope you are able to see the significance of our participation in this community, and I hope that you are able 
to welcome their participation and welcome their presence today. Thank you. Further announcements, Senator Goggin. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to thank everybody that has voted so far for the uh, Red Wing for the Business Revolution, uh, Small Biz Resolu Revolution. Uh, currently, as of yesterday, I'm proud to announce that they're in first place, but we can need to continue voting. Uh, it goes through 8 o'clock tonight, so please check your emails. I've had my uh, an email sent to everybody here in the Senate and all of the uh, staff. So please vote for Red Wing. Let's show our pride in our small communities in Minnesota. And uh, I look forward to coming back next week and uh, announcing, hopefully, that uh, Red Wing has earned the $500,000 uh, grant from Deluxe Corporation. Thank you, everyone, for your vote so far, and please keep voting. Thank you. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, members on your desks today was handed out a proclamation signed by our governor uh, acknowledging this as court reporting and captioning week. In my family, this comes um, to the forefront as my wife has been a court reporter her full working career. So I'm happy and honored to announce this today. Thank you. Senator Herr. Madam President, I want to make a point of personal privilege. State your points. Okay. Uh, Madam President and members, America is a great country, and we all love her. This morning, I joined a march starting from my district at the Mexican consulate to the state capitol here, demonstrate a day without immigrants. This is a strong statement, a phrase that refers to referring to every one of us except the natives. And this rally at noon, members of the native community are also part of that as well. I rise not to debate anyone on this issue opposing to the executive orders on our on immigration issues or policy, but I ask that in your personal moment, your personal time, give your thought and prayers for those who are suffering and for the families that are in this struggle. It's not easy for us to imagine the predicament of another person, let, a, let alone imagining being a refugee or an immigrant, a new immigrant, or a person without any doc documentation for one day. Imagine that yourself being that person for one day. Even I, who was once a refugee, find it difficult to think back, to think back to my early days of hardship, escaping government persecution at gunpoint, and living in refugee camp, feeling hungry, at the same time with authority treated you as sub subhuman, and your people as subhuman. And when you are finally reached the safety in this country of America, folks here tell you to go back to where you came from. These are just a few examples of the struggle many new Americans and immigrants still facing today. I ask not for your sympathy, but I ask that we find in our hearts, in our hearts to ask the divinity of our faith to bless those families who are suffering and to ease their pain during this tough and uncertain time. Thank you, Madam President. Further announcements of Senate interest. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Members, we're about to adjourn, but I want you to stick around for a special announcement after we adjourn from Senator Clausen. And with that, uh, members, uh, Madam President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, February 20th at 11 a.m. Senator Gazelka has moved we adjourn until Monday, February 20th at 11 a.m. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. We are adjourned. Senator Claussen. Well, thank you, Senator Gazelka. And I think uh, in all of our lives from time to time, there are prudent uh, events that take place that we really should share with colleagues. And so today, Senator Jim Carlson is celebrating his 70th birthday, and I just wanted you all to be aware of that. So thank you. 